welcome everyone to the annual Rotman Institute Lecture in, the philosophy, in Philosophy and Science. Each year, the Rotman Institute chooses a leading figure in Philosophy and Science as the Rotman Lecture, and they're invited to lecture to tell us about their uh, research. Previous Rotman Lecturers have included uh, Bill Wimsatt, the inaugural Rotman Lecturer, uh, Philip Kitcher in 2010-2011, and Nancy Cartwright last year, and this year's Rotman Lecturer is John Norton, who joins us from the University of Pittsburgh. It's a real pleasure to introduce John, who is a co-advisor for my dissertation work. I've learned an enormous amount from John over the last few years, and I've also learned a few things about him. Um, in particular, John has a unique ability to clarify even the most difficult problems by using diagrams and visual representations. He uses diagrams that represent everything from space-time to the flavor of single malt scotch, wh scotch whiskey. Um, so as an homage to this Newtonian uh, visual approach, I've decided to use a diagram to introduce John, which I'll call the Scholar Manifold. <laughs> so, the first corner of the Scholar Manifold represents research. Um, John got his start working on Einstein, which you'll hear more about soon. Um, and John has led the field in giving detail, a detailed reconstruction of how Einstein found his theory of gravity, based on carefully working through his uh, research notebooks and other manuscript sources. Um, if you think it'd be difficult to follow Einstein's path, then you're right. It's a very difficult and challenging task. Um, and that's something that John really excelled at, giving a clear reconstruction of how Einstein found his new theory of gravity. But aside from establish, establishing himself as one of the leading Einstein scholars, um, he's established himself as a leading philosopher of science in a variety of other areas as well. Um, he has a, a influential contributions in a, a, a wide variety of areas in general philosophy of science and philosophy of physics. The second corner of the scholar manual is teaching. Um, and it's easy to run out of superlatives in describing John's teaching abilities. Um, you'll see in just a few moments why he's beloved by undergraduate students at the University of Pittsburgh. He has a really uncanny ability to convey difficult ideas clearly through uh, lectures. And uh, as imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, let me, let, uh, let me tell you that I'm not the only former students of John's who has uh, copied one of his uh, most famous courses, which is called Einstein for Everyone. And I've been uh, running a version of that course here, as have other former students at other universities. And I can say that the best way to find uh, an introductory treatment of Einstein is still uh, John's course. Now that's available as a set of uh, basically an entire book, which he's published online, which you can find along with all kinds of other goodies on his website. Um, but in addition to being a, a gifted lecturer, John is a devoted and skilled mentor to his graduate students. Um, he, he has an uncanny ability to take something that you've written, see what's interesting and important in it, and then express it much more clearly than you did yourself. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I have personal experience with that process. And so uh, um, I, my writing was vastly improved by his guidance and feedback, but more than just that, he's been uh, He's incredibly devoted to his students and giving them the professional development and the skills that they need to go out on the job markets and so on. And he's, uh, he's been a, a, a very uh, a skillful mentor to me and to his other students throughout their careers. Finally, we turn to the third corner of the scotch, or, sorry, the smaller manifold, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, represents intellectual leadership. So John has been the director of the Center for Philosophy of Science for the last eight years, and he's been a tireless, energetic contributor to the profession of philosophy uh, in this and a variety of other ways. So as an organizer, as a, a conference series, as a, a member of the governing board of organizations, as a co-founder of the Philosophy of Science Archive, there, there's a long list of achievements here that have really made important contributions to the profession. And John has been um, uh, energetic in pursuing these and also visionary in finding ways to help the profession. So he's had an enormous positive impact on the profession through these contributions. So to sum up, uh, John occupies a unique location in the scholar manifold. Mainly he's right in the middle. He has important contributions in all three of these areas. 
few of us have achieved as much as he has in any one of them, but it's uh, a unique person that balances all three of these. So it's a real pleasure to welcome John here uh, as a Rama lecturer. Thanks. Things are going well. You can hear me now. Okay, excellent. Chris, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm touched and a little disappointed because um, when you give a talk, you try and manage expectations, so people aren't expecting that much. And you've really blown that strategy completely. Thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate everything. Um, let me. Uh, let me um, also give a thanks to your institute for inviting me here to give this talk. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure and a, a real honor to be included in the list of luminaries that you uh, included uh, um, earlier in the series. I, I hope I can live up to the standard that I'm sure that they've set. Okay, so let me get started. Um, Einstein. That's what I'm going to be talking about. And um, Einstein is someone who has occupied a very large part of my own professional life. I've spent a great deal of time, a lot of late nights, trying to understand better how Einstein did what he did. Uh, there have been uniformly rewarding and, and fascinating. Um, Einstein is my personal scientific hero. And I'm pleased to say that the sentiment is uh, shared fairly broadly. Uh, those of you who were paying attention December 31st, 1999, we'll have seen this time cover. Time selected Einstein uh, as the person of the century. And we can certainly understand why that is. I thought I might spend a moment and just catalog Einstein's scientific achievements just to give you a sense of the sweep of it. People tend to know a little piece here or a little piece there. But they don't tend to, they don't know just how, how broad it is. So I, I started putting together this transparency, this slide. Um, prior to 1905, the year that everyone knows, um, Einstein had already done a lot of work. Uh, in the years 1902 to 1904, he had uh, independently discovered the, uh, the basic framework of statistical mechanics that's used in a large part of physics. He independently discovered the, the Gibbs formalism and published it independently. Then when the uh, wonderful year of 1905 came along, he used that for his work on Brownian motion, the reality of atoms, and the light quantum. All that at the same time as he's producing the special theory of relativity equals mc squared. Then he went on after that to produce his general theory of relativity, which is his greatest achievement. The 1916 saw the A and B coefficient paper, the basic principles of laser. 1917, the beginnings of relativistic cosmology, efforts of unified field theory, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, I eventually gave up. Um, it's really not possible to put everything up there. There's a, there's a great deal more. Uh, but I think I've, I've said enough to indicate that Einstein's achievements in science surely made the designation of person of the century a well-deserved honor. And I'm happy to say that something else has happened. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, one more remark here. This is Cornelius Sainzos, who was um, uh, one of Einstein's uh, assistants. And I think he summed it up best. Um, I'll paraphrase and, and, and re-describe. I couldn't find the particular quote that I remember. This is a, a similar one. He said, who's the greatest physicist of the 20th century? Einstein, for his work in relativity. Who's the second greatest physicist of the 20th century? Einstein, for his work in statistical physics. I, I think that's, a, that's truly a, a, a fair assessment. Okay, so Einstein's now gone, but he, his thought lives on, and lives on as a cultural icon. I think it's an enormously interesting and a heartening phenomenon that Einstein has been taken to the bosom of the people overall. Uh, I find when I go places, they, people want to know what do I work on, and I say, well, I'm an Einstein scholar. Automatically, they know I'm a nice person. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful transition. So I, I, I wanted to give you a few indices of how that works, and I think there's no better index of the um, uh, no better standard for what is culturally cool than Apple, right? And so here's an advertisement that Apple Computer put out a while ago. It's a it's a quote from Einstein. There's Einstein. Think think different. Now, Apple didn't stop with just that one. A few years later, they have a second ad. This is an, another Einstein ad. 
But once you start looking for it, you're going to find Einstein as a kind of cultural hero all the way through the, uh, uh, th you know, through the just the modern popular press. And let me give you uh, another example of that because I think it's culturally so interesting. <laughs> this is a, an advertisement. For, 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 it's, it's actually a car advertisement, right? That's that's that, that's been, that's been run here. It's for the GMC Terrain SUV for the sexiest man alive. Uh, now, I think you're starting to realize um, that Einstein's presence in, 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 in the press is a bigger enterprise than just throwing up the occasional photo. And that's, that's correct. Uh, once you start looking at it, this, this was in 2009, if you look at what's happening around it, um, Einstein was the number seven top earning dead celebrity in the, in the Forbes listing. And um, the licensing rights to his image uh, was earning something like ten million dollars uh, uh, in, in the course of, um, uh, of, of one year. Um, uh, it, so there's an agency that's dealing with this. Um, at the time, it was the Richmond Agency. The Richmond Agency being the same agency that handles the rights to Marilyn Monroe's image. So Einstein's right up there. And you see, there's a lot of money there. The uh, the uh, the image of Einstein and his estate is owned by the Hebrew University. So I think you can probably predict what's happening next if there's a lot of money there. Can you? That's right. The Hebrew University sues uh, General Motors for the for the people's ad, claiming they didn't get the appropriate uh, uh, licensing. Okay. So let's continue on. This phenomenon of Einstein as a cultural hero has been replicated in other places. And it's become a theme that you also see among scientists. There's this mantra, when you look for it, find it everywhere. The mantra says, Einstein was, was right. And so I searched around in the literature, and I want to, I want to start working through the Einstein was right theme. So here's, here's one example. Um, Einstein's general theory of relativity says that Newton's account of gravity was almost exactly perfectly correct. Right? If you get a spinning object, stick it in orbit around the Earth, Newton's theory will give you almost exactly perfectly what that spinning object is going to do, with a very, very tiny, hard to measure uh, deviation. And after a tremendous amount of money and a tremendous, tremendous amount of effort, gravity probe B uh, was able to uh, uh, detect and find the effect that's known as the uh, frame, the frame dragging effect, and here you see the report of the, the, of the uh, success of the experiment. So uh, Einstein was right, and he certainly deserves all the all the credit for this. It's a uh, it's a real vindication of his of his thinking. So that's that's a nice one. Now you might have been noticing a few years ago uh, at CERN they had this embarrassment. The neutrinos that they thought were traveling faster than the speed of light. It turned out that they really weren't traveling faster than the speed of light. There were various errors that had been made in the course of um, running the experiments, one of them being a loose connector, which was especially embarrassing. And so, of course, the, 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 the result is reported as Einstein was right all along, neutrinos do not travel faster than light. Now, I'm, I'm getting a little uncomfortable with that um, because. You know, the special theory of relativity um, actually has a place for neutrinos. You can put neutrinos into special uh, neutrinos, uh, uh, tachyons, things that go faster than light, into special relativity if you want. They just behave very, very strangely. And so you'd rather they weren't there. But it's a strange behavior. It's not, it's not logical and possibility. Uh, the real complication is that tachyons aren't compatible with uh, relativistic quantum field theory, which is actually not Einstein's, Einstein's theory. OK, so you, you can get a sense of uh, where things are going. Uh, here's another example. I'll read the headline in case you can't see it. Einstein proved right over the universe. It is expanding at exactly, right, at exactly the speed he predicted driven by dark energy. Right, okay, so, so exactly how is that working? Well, uh, what's being talked about here is work that Einstein did in, in 1917. He introduced a cosmological model. Um, the model was not expanding. Right? And he didn't want it to expand. Right? What he did was he introduced an extra term, the lambda term that later gets transformed into dark energy. 
uh, in order to keep the whole thing stable and, 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 and safe. And, and almost immediately after he introduced the Lambda term, he decided he didn't like it. In 1918, he called it gravely detrimental to the beauty of the theory. And by 1932, when the expansion of the galaxies had been discovered, the, the Hubble expansion of the galaxies had, had been discovered, um, he and Decida together uh, wrote a paper in which they retracted it. Um, uh, there's a remark frequently in the literature uh, that, this, that Einstein called this his greatest blunder. Um, we only have that second hand. Uh, we have it from Gamow. Gamow reported that Einstein said that to him. It's actually not, uh, not a direct Einstein, but we can, we can affirm. So here's the paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, in which uh, Einstein and De Sitter uh, retract. I, I know you can't read the text, it's too small, so I, I pulled out the retraction. Historically, the term containing the cosmological constant lambda was introduced into field equations in order to enable us to account theoretically the existence of a finite main density in the steady universe. It now appears that in the dynamical case, this end can be reached without the introduction of lambda. So it's all over, we're done, it's finished. Einstein has abandoned it. The news travels slowly. <laughs> right, so there it is. Um, you can't, um, you know, um, what Einstein calls his worst mistake, scientists are now depending on the whole explain the, uh, the, uh, the universe. Okay, so let me continue on. Um, I don't know if those of you who are here are following the literature in, uh, in string theory, uh, but there's an idea that string theory has finally brought us the, the completion of physics, the ultimate unification of, of all physical forces. Uh, this is a popular book written by, uh, by Kaku uh, called Bjorn Einstein. I'll pull out the essential quote. Um, it is the fulfillment of Albert Einstein's lifelong dream of a theory of everything uniting the laws of physics into a single description. Uh, if you know anything about Einstein, you'll, you'll know that that's wrong on just about every level possible. Um, this was not Einstein's dream. String theory is uh, Einstein's nightmare. Um, <laughs> experts here will, will understand the difference here. First, it is fundamentally quantum mechanical theory. Einstein thought quantum mechanics was not the fundamental theory. There was a deeper theory to be found. Second, um, string theory, at least the early versions that, that, I've, that I've seen, are based on the Minkowski spacetime. The spacetime is special relativity with stuff happening inside it. Einstein thought his greatest achievement was getting rid of that with his general theory of, uh, of, of, of relativity. Okay, so you, I think you're getting a sense of where this is going, so let me give you another, another example. Um, Einstein was right, uh, we're told, you can be in two places at once. Now, what's being, what's being talked about here uh, is superposition in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics has this, this weird thing where you can take two separated states and they somehow combine together in a superposition so that a single particle can be both here and there and experimental tests are starting to reveal that this certainly is happening on larger and larger scales than, than, uh, than we uh, 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 maybe had a right to imagine earlier on. So Einstein was right. Well, that was certainly never Einstein's idea. Um, Einstein was an outspoken critic of exactly that idea because Einstein but also Rosen joint work was designed to argue that, that, that exactly that was not happening and that all of this was the, the, and that all of the probabilities of quantum mechanics uh, was simply an illusion deriving from the incompleteness of the theory. Um, that seemed pretty clear in the historical record, but um, it's very hard to get that message through. So I'll pull out a little quote here that I thought was interesting. Um, the highlighted words say, Coincidentally, it proves that Albert Einstein was right when he thought he was wrong. I've been trying to parse that sentence, and I, don't, I can't figure out what it actually says. <laughs> but anyway, right, so I'll, um, I'll leave it at that. So where can, we, where can we possibly go with this? Well, I'll, oops, I'll, I'll leave you with one more example of that. This is the telegraph. It's, it's, it's all over the internet. Um, the headline says, Einstein was right. Honey bee collapse threatens global food security. <laughs> and then the quote at the end says, Albert Einstein, who liked to make bold claims, often wrong, famously said that if the bee disappears off the surface of the globe, man would have only four years to live. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. This is, it's a complete fabrication. <laughs> 
all over the internet now. Einstein is the expert on, 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 on these. <laughs> so, so, it's gratifying. I'm, I'm very happy that Einstein is a popular hero. If you think of, and as a scientific theory, the hero, if you think of all the people that could be, it's, you know, we're ready to feel better off. Right? Um, there's a, a serious danger that scientists have become um, um, uh, malevolent figures. There's a serious danger that the image, that the popular image of the, of the scientist becomes that of Dr. Strangelove. Right? You, know, you know, the dangerous, um, uh, malevolent, even possibly mad scientist. Uh, that's not happening. Uh, nonetheless, I, I do think we need to um, uh, recalibrate. Right? Now, this, I think, is what Einstein has become in the, uh, in, in the popular art. Right? This is Einstein setting the being of the 21st century. The idea being that he somehow knew at the beginning of the 20th century everything that was going to happen in the 21st century and, and, and on. So you can understand then I want to recalibrate this. And that's what this, this talk is about. Right? I didn't tell you at the beginning, but uh, that's what this talk is about. I, I suggest we need to recalibrate our understanding of Einstein's work and, and his achievement. And I think the best way that I can do that is by showing you this. Um, I think there's a real sense that Einstein was also a man of the, 20, of the 19th century. So that's my, my proposal for the counter time cover. Uh, there's a lot in Einstein that is 19th century. Now, once you start looking for it, you begin to find lots and lots of it. And that's what I'll go through now. That's what I'll be lining up my talk. I want to work through various aspects of Einstein's science and make the case for why a lot of what he did really um, uh, belongs in the 19th century or the natural continuation or completion of things that were happening in the 19th century. I'm going to go through a bunch of categories here. I'm going to talk about elements of his science, the actual content of the science. Uh, it was in many ways, the ways that I'll make clear here at the moment, the fulfillment of 19th century ideas, that the methods that he used Again, we're developing things that were only 19th century in, in character. Uh, and finally, he had an outlook that in the ways that, that I'm describing there truly um, developed and grew in the 19th century. So I've got quite, you know, I've got science methods and outlook, and I have two examples of the beach that I'll, that I'll work through uh, uh, for you. So let's, let's start at the beginning. Let's look at the, uh, at, at the science. One of the major discoveries of the 19th century was the atomic theory of matter. It was the recognition that the air in the room, water coming out of the faucet, is not a continuous fluid as it appears to, to us at this microscopic level, but at a very minute level, it consists of many discrete atoms and molecules. Right? It's a major discovery of the 19th century. Um, at the time that Einstein was working, this was a discovery that was um, not well incorporated uh, in the science. Now, the difficulty was not that scientists are inherently just slow to accept new ideas. It was a bit of difficulty. The difficulty was it was not clear that you needed the atoms. Right? Uh, physical chemistry at the time was doing a terrific job of returning all the properties of matter that were recoverable through normal experiment. So if you want to get a, get a sense of of the way things were looking, an analogy might help. Uh, you've all heard that in the 19th century, theories of electricity and magnetism were founded on ether theories. You had a magnetic field coming out of a magnet, an electric field coming from an electric charge, and the idea was that those fields were not things in their own right, but they were in turn manifestations of some deeper ether, which um, had maybe a little clockwork mechanism hidden in there, and that to do ether mechanics, sorry, that to do electromagnetism was to understand ether mechanics. Of course, the ether hypothesis fell by the wayside, and we now think, phew, I was a close call, but glad they didn't take that one terribly seriously. Well, they didn't take that one terribly seriously for the same reason they weren't taking atoms terribly seriously. You don't really need it to do Maxwell's electromagnetism. What was needed was someone to come along and say, wait a minute, here's something that you cannot do unless you adopt the atomic hypothesis. And that's what Einstein did with his work on, on, uh, on Brownian motion. He gave an analysis of, 
of the jiggly motion of um, the tiny pollen grains that are visible under the microscope. And the only way to make sense of that uh, was to assume that the water in which the, uh, uh, the pollen grains were sitting uh, had a molecular constitution. And the accumulated effect of very many collisions with these water molecules was leading the pollen grain to, to, uh, to, to jiggle, jiggle about. So, you know, major discovery, major turning point, but a fulfillment of what was happening in the course of 19th century science. A fulfillment of an, of an idea that had an atomic constitution, that had a, a long history, and was really brought into um, the form of a cogent theory by Maxwell and Boltzmann in the course of the second part of the, of the 19th century. Now, let's look at special relativity. Special relativity is the theory that tells us how things behave when they move very, very rapidly. That, that's how it differs from the theories that, that came before. Uh, it's not possible to get a reliable theory of what things are doing when they move very rapidly until you have some probe that will actually test out um, reliably how things uh, behave when they move very rapidly. Such a probe was developed in the course of the 19th century. This was the um, uh, the Maxwell, um, oops, it says Boltzmann, it shouldn't be Boltzmann there. Uh, this, was, uh, this was the Maxwell Hertz Lawrence uh, theory of electrodynamics, and it was distinctive in that it gave us the first very well developed theory of something moving very, very fast, and that something was light. So, built into the theory itself was an encoding of the strange behavior of things that move very rapidly there that lengths get contracted, that times get slowed down, down that simultaneity gets messed up. It's, all, it's already in there. What Einstein did was to look inside the theory and pull it out in a very particular way. Now the equations that, that govern the effects that I've just described for you are known as the Lorentz transformation equations. They're known as the Lorentz transformation equations because they were written down first by Lorentz uh, in the course of his electrodynamic uh, investigations. What Einstein did was to extract them and say, wait a minute, these equations are not peculiar to electrodynamics. Electrodynamics is giving us a bigger message about how it is that very rapidly moving things are going to begin to behave. It's not an electrodynamic message, it's a, it's a message about space and time. Uh, and, and that is the special theory of relativity. Uh, nowadays, people like to think of the special theory of relativity as coming because Einstein sat in a comfy chair for half an hour and thought very hard about what happens when you try and synchronize clocks with light signals. Now, but that's not at all what happened. Einstein, on his own accounting, spent seven or four years playing around with problems in electrodynamics, and then finally, in a moment of desperation, after everything had failed, he began to think some crazy thoughts and managed to make them all work out in the theory. But it was a moment of desperation. He didn't know what else to do. There was, no, there was nowhere else to go. Now, let's, let's look at Einstein's methods. Right. We're going to see a similar story here. I described for you how Einstein had um, secured the atomic theory of matter uh, into the corpus of modern science. And he did that because he developed better than anyone before him a very particular technique that fell straight out of work in statistical physics. He became an expert at doing this looking at the macroscopic properties of bodies, their energies, the thermodynamic properties, entropies, and the other things that are associated with the pressure, the volumes, and how they all interact, and recognizing how those properties were giving you a clue to the internal constitution, right, that there was a particular molecular constitution. So for example, if you discover that um, that some, uh, some uh, system obeys an ideal gas law, and you know how to read that fact, as Einstein did, you can infer immediately that that system consists of very many localized particles that do not interact with one another. It's a very general result, and Einstein, Einstein was very familiar with this. This had been his project, starting with his very first paper, to go from the macroscopic properties of bodies to figure out their microscopic constitution. So Einstein had this big repertoire tuned to solve the problem of 19th century physics. Are there really atoms there or not? Okay. And as a byproduct, something interesting happened. He's looking at the thermal properties of a different system. He's looking at the thermal properties of heat radiation. 
and he discovers the very same signatures as he found for ordinary matter. Ordinary matter, he found an atomic signature, that the, that the matter is actually not continuous, but divided into, into small independent points. Einstein found that same signature when he was looking at high frequency radiation. And so he then made the natural supposition that comes immediately from that. The natural supposition that comes immediately from that uh, is that high frequency uh, radiation consists of many localized quanta, and that's the light quantum hypothesis. Now, the way that I, that I tell that story now, that, that describes what happened, and I think it makes Einstein's discovery intelligible. He was applying 19th century methods to a new problem. He had the tool, and he, and he applied it. It's not the way the story is normally told. If you start looking for the pathway to the light pointer by thinking about electrodynamics, you don't see this. What you see is that Maxwell's wave theory of light was the most successful theory of the 19th century. It was the great unification that brought together electric and magnetic fields and light all in one. And the idea that you would ever overturn a wave theory of light just seems extraordinary and baffling. But if you now set that aside and think of Einstein as a master of statistical physics, it becomes intelligible how he could come to that result. Doesn't make the result any less extraordinary in the end because he had to have the conviction of the correctness of the methods that they were indeed telling him the, the right result. But then he was Einstein, I guess that's why he's Einstein and I'm, and I'm not. I wouldn't have had the courage to, uh, to do it. So let me move on. Geometry. Um, if you can identify moments when things change dramatically, there was a moment in the 19th century when mathematics changed. It, it advanced to a new level of sophistication, a new reach. And the area where this was happening was, was in geometry. It was a very exciting time in the 19th century. Beginning of the century, people understood geometry to mean mostly Euclidean geometry. That was the geometry of space. Over the course of the 19th century, there was a recognition that there were many other geometries possible. They all had to be taken seriously. And mathematical tools had to be developed that would accommodate all these geometries. There was an explosion of new mathematics. I've mentioned here clients a London program that uses group theory to uh, catalog all the, uh, all the different geometries that, that were possible. I've mentioned also the Ricci and Felicia, Felicia Viva absolute differential calculus, we now call that the tensor calculus. This was a general mathematical tool that, that was in place in the journals at the, uh, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century as a mathematical tool for anyone out there to use. So what did Einstein do? Einstein took those discoveries in geometry and then applied them in physics. He had certain physical problems to solve, and he said, what are the best mathematical methods out there that will help me solve this? He actually asked his friend Marcel Grossman to help him with this problem. Marcel Grossman went to the library, found the Ricci and Levitch and Vita article on the absolute differential calculus, which had been pretty much neglected at, 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 at that point, brought it to Einstein, and they simply applied it to gravity and, well, the rest is history. Well, simply applied to gravity. Uh, it took Einstein three years of intense and painful work to solve the simple problem of applying the Ricci Limited Meter uh, calculus to gravity. And what came out at the end of this was general relativity. Um, uh, an extraordinary theory, a wonderful theory. Uh, in my view, the discovery of this theory is one of the greatest achievements of humankind of human speculative thought, the fact that, that Einstein could sit essentially by himself with a little help and produce this theory is one of the great creative moments of, 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 our, of our history, fully equal to anything uh, that you see in the, in, in, in the arts. Now let's talk about Vega themes, outlook. If you, if you want to find a 19th century outlook, it's there in Einstein as well. Let me, let me talk about that. One of the major themes of the 19th century was the idea of the unity of forces. The century began with this idea that there were many forces present. Electric forces, thermal forces, magnetic forces, light, heat, all sorts of, all sorts of stuff like that. And the driving force in much of the research done in the, uh, uh, in the 19th century was to see how they could 
interact with one another, what, what they look like as a unified whole. Um, I've, I've reproduced here an engraving from one of Faraday's uh, uh, publications. This is the magnetic rotation apparatus, which illustrates the unity of, of, of motion and electric current and magnetism all, 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 all in one thing. And of course, the idea of the 19th century came to be that all of these things were in the case of light and electricity and magnetism, all of them were manifestations of this single underlying ether. Right? Now, if you know anything about Einstein, you know that theme of unity is Einstein's theme. Uh, the unified field theory became his, his passion, it became his life. Um, after he completed the general theory of relativity, he moved you know, with some dedication and focus onto finding this single theory, this unified field theory that would combine um, uh, the, uh, the forces of, well, not much forces anymore, but combine gravity and electromagnetism into a, um, into a single unified field, which would be the state of an underlying something. Um, now, you might think we should call that ether because it's the, it's the same idea. Um, Einstein intended not to use the word ether, but with a little bit of pressure from, from uh, Lawrence, uh, that's exactly what Einstein did. This is the front page of, of his, um, um, of his uh, lecture given in, in Leiden in 1920. It's called Ether and the Theory of Relativity, uh, and he identifies the, the background electrical field that, uh, that, kept, that is carrying um, uh, gravity, and, and he hopes eventually electromagnetism uh, as an ether. Uh, the reason is uh, that um, Einstein had a very special affection for Lawrence. Um, he regarded him as something of a, a father figure, um, uh, not just for his scientific work, but uh, also for his um, um, uh, human qualities. Are we still quiet here? Um, Am yeah. I doing something wrong? I'm not sure. <laughs> Am I speaking falsehoods that have been filtered by the. <laughs> speaking retrospectively over how people understood the notion of causation uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the 19th century. And what's interesting, is he says at the beginning, the laws of the external world were also taken to be complete in the following sense. And then he continues to give the standard definition of determinism. If you fix the present state of the system, then its future is also determined. So that's the, uh, that's the idea of, uh, of, of, of causation that he had in mind. Now, Einstein never sat well with quantum mechanics. Right? And he had all sorts of reasons. There was EPR, there were, there were other things as well. But there was one enduring remark that he said again and again and again. It was the short answer. If you, know, if you, if you asked the question and you wanted a short answer, and you know what the short answer was. Uh, the short answer was, um, you know, I am convinced that he does not play dice. Right? Uh, God does not play dice for the universe. If you ask Einstein, um, why don't you like quantum mechanics, to put it into more uh, academic language, I don't like it because it's, a determ it's an indeterministic theory, um, and as a result, it's, it's incomplete. Right? Now, of course, recalling the, uh, the, the, the title of, um, of Einstein's EPR paper, that's the, that's the rough, the rough uh, wording of it. So he wanted um, a complete theory that would cover the phenomena that were governed by.
<laughs> he wanted a complete theory, and the theory was going to, uh, was going to look like the theories of the 19th century that had probabilities in them. The probabilities simply arose because you had incomplete information about the full state of the system. Right? The, uh, the energy of, um, of some thermal system fluctuates around some main probabilistically simply because you don't know exactly the positions and velocities and other interactions of all the particles that, that, make, it, that make it up. Okay. So how are we to think of Einstein? Um, it is, of course, completely unfair to say he was just a 19th century thinker. No, that, that's, that's certainly not the case. But it's all, it also does Einstein a disservice if we turn him into the prescient figure who somehow knew everything that was coming. So what's left? What does a, a, a balanced appraisal of, of Einstein look like? Um, now, I'm, I'll confess I'm not a huge fan of Thomas Kuhn, but the guy can write. Right? And he has this just wonderful, wonderful metaphor. Uh, he applied it to Copernicus, but I think it applies perfectly to, to Einstein as well. He gets us to imagine a long straight road, and there's a bend in the road, and then, then there's another long straight section. Right? And if you see the photo on the right here, um, after a fair amount of digging, um, I found this photo. This is Einstein. Uh, leaving the Institute for Advanced Study, going home, there's the pathway leads away from the Institute, it takes a left turn, right, just, he's, he's, he's at the spot, he's just about to turn the corner, so it's perfectly right. Well, so, the idea is that when you come to a corner like that, right, um, if you're in the first stretch, all you see is that stretch of the road, you can see the corner as the end point, right. Um, if you turn the corner and you're in the new stretch, and you look back, all you can see is the corner, nothing more. So, you, you, so on the one stretch you think of the corner as the end, on the other stretch you think of it as the beginning. I hope you see the analogy there, this is the 19th century, this is the 20th century. We have been standing in the stretch of road that is the 20th century, and we look back and we simply see Einstein standing at the corner as the beginning, as though it all sort of came out from nowhere. Right? Um, so, so what's the better appraisal? Well, Einstein is that transitional figure that stands at the corner. He, he, he doesn't really belong fully to either part of the road. Right? You know, I, you know, Einstein um, is as much a 19th century figure as he is a 20th century figure. So um, I've been emphasizing the 19th century parts in order to correct what I hope you'll agree from my earlier slides has been uh, uh, a, a, a shifting of, of Einstein into the wrong century. He's not a 21st century thinker. Right? So that's really the end of my story. Um, if you've enjoyed this and would like to have a little more, um, let, let me tell you that I, um, I have a very rich website which has lots and lots of stuff on it. If you go to the, the, the heading that says lectures and click a few times, you'll eventually come to this page. Uh, which includes uh, this PowerPoint that I've been speaking to, it's linked on the bottom there, uh, and a few other things that might interest you. The story that I've told of Einstein as the uh, greatest of the 19th century physicists, I kind of laid it all out there for you, so the things that I just said to you now, you can, you can read them uh, written up in a paper. And if you want to read some more stuff, Chris already talked about it, but I've got lots and lots of stuff in this. This is an online book, Einstein for everyone. Um, lots and lots of chapters, lots and lots of stuff. It's a bit scattered. It, it, its chapters tend to be written according to whatever happened to interest me at the moment that I was thinking about them. So, you know, um, and so I hope that means they might uh, interest you as well. So,
general theory, of course, it was tested by uh, so and so that was that experiment before, and of course that made a whole household name. But then he turned against those who were quantum physics, quantum mechanics and so on. He said that what made the reason he said and he wouldn't agree with Kyle Bohr on that. Now the thing is, uh, the E P is BPR experiment, now the a late aspect of those tests, and Bell in the following theory, then the design was everything that he did to that I understand the position of different things. That there's still, uh, it's, it's not specific in that quantum mechanics and that was wrong, I have to put on them, that uh, it, it is, it's part of the physical world of change relativity and general relativity, and that's what they're trying to work on today. Mm -hmm. But there are physicists I have met them who are not enthusiastic about uh, straight theory or M theory. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Thank you. you raised a whole bunch of things. Do you mind if I respond fairly haphazardly to some of the things that you? Yes, uh, the, the upshot of the VPR is that Einstein was wrong on that one. Right? Um, the aspect experiment certainly made uh, a great deal of trouble from the view that Einstein had. The, the ongoing project is to figure out how we should now think about that. The short answer seems to be that um, uh, quantum systems are non-local and we better get used to that idea. That, that seems to be the, the upshot. You raise a more interesting question. Though, that, that's, that's well settled. And that is, uh, what is, what was Einstein's attitude to experiment? Right? Um, it was clever. Um, uh, it, was, it was not simple-minded. Uh, those of you who have read some philosophy of science with a bread popper, and popper describes how, how you know, Einstein loved to expose his theories to experimental test, and the moment that they were refuted by the experimental test, he would humbly and meekly submit to the verdict of nature and move on with new projection. No, that, that goes too far. That, that was not Einstein. Um, he showed, he, he certainly recognized the importance of experiment, and a great deal of what he did came directly out of experiment. But he also took the longer view, and there are numerous examples, I'll see if I can remember a bunch of them. He also took the, uh, took the longer view, um, and, and took the longer view all the way through. Uh, very early on, um, Einstein's special theory of relativity was under challenge. It predicted that um, the mass of an electron would increase with velocity according to a very particular formula. And experiments done in 1907, I think it was Kaufman, uh, produced a dependence on velocity that did not fit. Um, Einstein was fairly dismissive of that, and he simply, he simply said he didn't believe the alternative theories because they were based on, uh, on, on assumptions that had a lower probability. Just essentially shrugged them off, and he was right. Experiments done a year or two later indicated the Einstein, Einstein Lorentz formula to be, uh, to, be more, to be more precise. Michael Samal experiment came under uh, repeated scrutiny uh, in the early 1920s. Um, um, Miller, was it Dayton C. Miller, if I remember correctly, uh, repeated the Michael Samal experiment, got a positive result. Um, Einstein didn't spend too much time worrying about it. Um, those of you who know how far physics had come by the 1920s will realize that the early <coughs> special relativity by then was already impossible. Um, Einstein conjectured that uh, Miller had not accounted properly for thermal gradients in the lab, and sure enough, that's what had happened when they did the tests. Um, here's, a, here's another one that's interesting. Um, the great success of uh, the general theory of relativity in November of 1915 was that it predicted the, um, uh, the anomalous motion of Mercury exactly, without any fudging, any adjustable parameters. Right? So you might well wonder, what would have happened if General Assembly had given the wrong result? Wouldn't, wouldn't Einstein have had to say, oh well, nice theory, but it failed the crucial test? Well, there's, a, there's another story there that you're... Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, was, this, was, this was Einstein talking to Ilse Rosenstahl Schneider about the, the eclipse expedition. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's a different story. That's a different story. Let, let, me, let me finish one time. Yeah. So, so we, we, can, we can conjecture what, what would Einstein have, um, uh, what would Einstein have, have done. Um, answer. Uh, we know what he would have done. Right? And the answer is nothing. How do we know that? Well, prior to 1915, Einstein had a different theory. He couldn't find what we now know as the modern Einstein equations, 
And so he um, ended up publishing uh, a, a different paper with Marcel Grossman, one of the one of the worst near misses of all time. Um, if you want to get a sense of, of, of how bad a near miss it was, imagine Newton having discovered the complete system of, of, um, of, the, of the world, right? the entire apparatus, all the laws of motion, all the techniques for computing trajectories, the works, thinking about the possibility of an inverse square law, and then deciding that no, it couldn't be an inverse square law, deciding it had to be an inverse cube law, and then going ahead and publishing it as, you know, as a kind of a free principium. Uh, Einstein did the analog of that. Right. Now you can imagine how unhappy Newton would be, and that's how unhappy Einstein was. He knew something was wrong for the longest time. That theory gave the wrong prediction for Mercury. Uh, now he didn't uh, remark on that in print, but he uh, exchanged uh, calculations with a, uh, um, uh, with a friend, Nicola Besso, in which they calculated the motion of Mercury, the motion of Mercury and they got it wrong. I don't recall the exact numbers now, but they got it, they got it so far along that they were off by, in a calculation, by orders of magnitude for a while. And, um, and Einstein just didn't seem to be bothered by it. And, uh, this work, by the way, done a uh, uh, reconstruction of the Velvet Notebook by uh, Michelle Johnson, who did a wonderful job of, of, uh, of, of working through that. So, you know, Einstein had a nuanced view, and um, um, the story that's told about the um, light bending is, an, is another case where you can read it two ways, but he was really so 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 keen on, um, on the experimental test. He took a longer view. And I think and I think appropriately. I, I, don't, I don't think you, you throw out a good theory. You know, you know, it's the, when the first experimental result comes in that looks a little awkward. We have another question over here. Nick, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, sometimes in the history of math, though, as opposed to history of physics, we see that we uh, hear or we see that uh, David Hilbert uh, discovered the GR independently, uh, and I don't know much about that. But could you? Uh, oh, good. Let's <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, see if I can get the story straight here. All right. Um, uh, this is the uh, this is the basic chronology of what happened. Um, so Einstein was. You know, had the sketch of the theory in 1913 and began working on improving it. New things weren't right, it's working. It's working. Uh, in the summer of 1915, he goes to Göttingen and gives a, gives a talk to the assembled luminaries, Hilbert and Klein, uh, on, general, on general relativity, what is to become general relativity. Uh, Klein, um, uh, Hilbert rather starts working on the theory. In the meantime, uh, Einstein realizes something's wrong with the theory. He has a miserable time in the course of that, of that fall. And by the beginning of November of 1915, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's pulled himself out of the mistake that, he, that he'd made. Uh, I won't go into the details of what the mistake was. There were, there were a bunch of them, and they cascaded one, on, one, one upon the other. Uh, and he started sending communications to the Prussian Academy in which he was making a, a stepwise return to general relativity. It was actually four communications, each correcting the one before in kind of desperation to sort of get the thing out and get the thing out and get the thing out. The third one, by the way, before he has completed the theory, is the one that has the uh, explanation of the uh, anomalous motion of Mercury in it. At the same time, Hilbert is working on the theory as well. And Hilbert is producing um, uh, but, you know, the, the modern version, it's the paper that has what's known as the Hilbert action, you might come across it uh, in it. Right? And, um, uh, and the documentary record shows the following, um, that Hilbert um, communicated that to the um, Göttingen Academy on November 20th. Right? So that's the, uh, November 25th, Einstein sends his final communication to the Prussian Academy. So there's a, there's a five day gap. And so there the story became what, what happened. Did Einstein, um, and, and, and there was some communication between Einstein and Hilbert. We've seen some of the letters, and I don't think we have all of them. So what happened? And this has fueled this, this question what, what, what happened? Um, it was left open until oh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, Leo Corey was working at the Gertrude Archive, and he discovered the proof pages of Hilbert's paper. And the proof pages of Hilbert's paper told a very different story. Hilbert, it seems, 
would like to do massive corrections to papers in between the proof stage and the final printing stage. And in the proof pages, Hilbert did not have the same theory that's in the published paper that we now can see. He, in fact, had what he thought was Einstein's original theory with all the defects. Now, he'd given it a rather odd mathematical formulation that I, that, I, that, I, that I want to go into. And there's a point in the paper where the Hilbert action might still be written, even though he interprets it very differently from the way that we would do now. The difficulty is that that part of the page has been cut off. <laughs> oh. um, so this has been, you know, um, there's a segment of the community out there that likes to you know, see, you know, see Einstein's undeserving of the credit that he has. And so this has fueled all sorts of terrible conspiracy theories as to exactly what happened. Uh, my own guess of what happened is the following. It's quite plausible that the piece that was cut off had the formula for the uh, Riemann curvature tensor on it, which is, the, which is the crucial thing, and that it was cut off from top of the nine reasons. Um, if ever you have the pleasure of writing papers that involve writing down the Riemann curvature tensor, it's a mathematical expression that extends over two lines. It's long and complicated. You've got to get all the indices exactly matching up in just the right way. So if you're writing a paper like that, you want to get the right formula in there. You have some proof pages sitting there, and the, proof, and the proofs, you know, it's all gone, you know, just snip it off, paste it, and you're done. That's my, that's my conjecture. But, okay. So, so I, I think that's the, that's, the, that's the best answer that I can give. Um, Hilbert himself um, never claimed credit, nor did Hilbert regard himself as someone who was working in physics. His idea was he had a project where he would take the work of physicists and put them in better mathematical clothing because he regarded the, the physicists as, as being loose and sloppy mathematically. Why, why would he think that? <laughs> um, but he also famously said that mathematics and physics is obviously much more difficult. In the back? Um, yeah. I knew that was later. He said. Um, physics is obviously much more difficult than physics. <laughs> yes, yes, I think that's right. I knew that was later. That yeah. was okay. I, people who quantum theory were obviously. Yeah, I'm trying to track that one down. He also said that. Um, he said that every rapscallion in the, in the streets of Birmingham knows more mathematics than Einstein, but it was Einstein. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a slide that you showed uh, about uh, uh, predetermination, like uh, the determinism that mm -hmm. Einstein has talked about. Uh, like if the present is determined, uh, then the future is determined. Do you want to see it? Is that Yes, one? Uh, so Einstein said that you know, he's against the completeness of quantum theory and uh, like, I mean, uh, yeah, but he did not prove it, right? Or rather, if Einstein thinks that you know, everything is predetermined, does it not contradict uh, something like uh, Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty principle? Like, we cannot determine completely. Yeah, um, Einstein hoped that it would be possible to produce a deterministic theory that, that would capture all of the effects that were present in, in quantum mechanics. Um, it now seems difficult to do that. The, the einstein podolsky rosen paper was an effort to argue why the theory had to be complete and, uh, and, 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 that, and that failed. Um, so, um, Perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll pass over, over that one, but um, because this is an area of ongoing research in, in philosophy of quantum mechanics, I'll just get myself into trouble. There's, there's a mainstream view that, um, that holds that, uh, that quantum mechanical theories are inherently deterministic, and there's nothing you can do about that. But then there are alternative theories that people push, things like the Bohm theory, uh, where they attempt to, to recover determinism in quantum mechanics. So, you know, um, there, there, are, there are great difficulties in doing that. Um, I think the kosher specter theorem, if you've ever come across it, is one of the uh, more interesting results in that area. Do you, what, you want to chime in on this? Yeah, please <laughs> well, No, I, I think there's another respect, which you haven't actually mentioned, but... Um, I'll turn back. Pardon me.
And that is that I think that he took mathematics in something like the Galilean sense of the really, uh, it's, it's, it's the language in which the book of nature is actually written. Yes. And I think that was a very serious element of his act, which I think. And I think it would be very great right, the way that he followed the relationship between mathematics and physics. And one of the things he was clearly unhappy with, especially in quantum theory, where I really, what, what is the, the, you know, the, the way function exactly? What does it describe? It doesn't describe anything literally. It, of course, is true, it gives you probabilities. It lives in this space where it's continuous, and then you have to have a collapse of all those other difficulties. But I do think that Einstein was very unhappy with the idea of simply taking the mathematics in a purely formalistic way. And then simply ending up with something which then worked when you made the experiment, but for which there wasn't any really new, any real direct connection at all. And I think Einstein had very much that, that classical view about the relationship between mathematics and physics, which was very much an idea. I have to think about that one. That, that's interesting. Right? Let me go back to the beginning, because what, what you said was, was exactly right. Um, there was a, and I'll just tell a bit of a story about Einstein, because, it, because you, you told it well. Um, uh, Einstein started out with a birth sympathies towards certain positivistic ideas, you know, philosophically, although there's questions to how serious he could ever have been, because he worked so hard on, on, on getting atoms to, uh, in, in, into the system. Uh, the experience with general relativity changed him. This is something I've documented fairly carefully. What happened with general relativity, the story that I, I told you a little bit, uh, Einstein almost lost credit for the theory, he almost lost the theory. Yes. Hilbert. Yeah, and, was, uh, and Hilbert almost effortlessly wrote down the right equations just by writing down the mathematically simplest equations. So Einstein started writing, you know, as it were, post mornings on the on the activity of, of, of what happened, uh, and um, he had. A, we, we can actually document this from from his notebooks, his calculational notebooks. He had an idea of there being two ways that you could advance uh, in physics. One is by using physical argumentation. So you think of principles like you know, energy conservation, and the purest expression of, of, of physical argumentation would be thought experiments. Right? And, and, and you see, I'm now describing the early Einstein. That's what we worked with early on. Then there was the, the later Einstein. Uh, and the later Einstein uh, would look for mathematical uh, beauty and simplicity. He wanted the simplest equations. The lesson that Einstein took away from general relativity was that he needed to switch into the second method. Because the second method would have given him general relativity almost immediately, whereas, whereas the first method led him on a wild goose chase for you know, for, for, for over three years. So these ideas developed both in general relativity, and by the early 1930s, uh, he gave the Herbert Spencer lecture. And I don't have the quotes memorized, but uh, he says things like, nature is the realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical ideas. And, and, and you know, he is as overtly a mathematical Platonist as anyone can be. Uh, therefore, in a certain sense, I hold it true that pure thought can grasp reality as the ancients dreamed. I think that's, a, that's well, pretty much the same. I'm sorry? Well, I don't think that it you know, upset the Soviet thing that there was big arguments. You know, they saw the physicists and they could not, like, to make Einstein acceptable there. And precisely arguments that, that Einstein came up with, assertions like that. Oh, here, bourgeois ideas are terrible. And then we see this enormous respect for Einstein. Yeah. Another story, right? The whole impact that it had, that relativity had but, on the communist country. So something else you said. So you think that sort of Platonism is characterizable as a 19th century idea? That, that, that's yes, I think the connection with uh, certainly the connection between mathematics, or the, the mathematical ideas and, and physical was very much an idea that was in mm -hmm. the 19th century. A lot of a lot of uh, in category of that notion, he thought that the transfinite set it would have direct physical applications. You have know, the language that I just used. Nature is the realization of mathematical surplus ideas, you know, as the ancient screen. Is there any that sort of language? In general? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I, no, I mean, no, I think, I think that the, the idea was that there was uh, some kind of harmony, like between the, the, math, the, the elements of the mathematical description, the physical, and if the simplicity was something that was in the mathematics, it would in some way, your account of that thing would be different from one another. You know, from one mathematician of the time is another. But the point was, I think the kind of split from the game, at least what was called Hope, really was that, that actually there are elements in one of the unsatisfactory things 
uh, I, I think, as far as Einstein was concerned, the quantum theory was to fight the mathematics of the basic. Of course, it was Hilbert's view. He was all kinds of abstract stuff. He used group representations. It's enormously mathematically sophisticated. Where are the elements of reality that actually come from? Well, there is that quote where he says, the, the greater is success, the more silly it looks. Or the silly it looks. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. And so I think that was another, <laughs> I, I think that was very much about the 19th century or an idea that sort of culminated in the way. You were guided by mathematics, but fields may have been absent, but they were still regarded, you know, the, the actual theory. He, he's describing something real. I mean, even if it's true, it turns out to be rather elusive and maybe philosophical. And quantum theory really did, or we know that's what gave me oh, philosophy of quantum theory is so sort of popular because there are serious philosophical questions there. You know, I, I mean in that regard as to the, as to what the mathematics actually refers to. Yeah. I mean, at least with Tetris and so on, yes, it actually but nevertheless, they actually represent a certain kind of geometric which which are realizing yeah. More or less correct. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly a flip, right? 
we've seen very mysterious. Uh, what Shulman found, however, was that the flip had nothing to do with Einstein. They simply had changed the grading scale <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, from, from one, one year to the, to the next. So, you know, so um, Einstein clearly had some difficulties with language. Uh, I don't think there's any real evidence that he had difficulty with science. I mean, he was, you know, you know he was fascinated by the Pythagorean theorem. I think he found his own proof of it. You know, as a, as a kid, and so on and so on. Now, there, there, uh, there are some reports that, that he was that he was dyslexic. Um, I don't think there's any evidence that I've seen of dyslexia. They all go back to a story that he would um, that he would um, repeat things. Uh, he would say a sentence to himself when he was very young before he said it out loud. This came from his sister, who wrote a biography in the 19 in the 1920s, an unpublished biography that, that's in the papers. But that's about all. I've read a lot of Einstein, and if dyslexia comes with inverting letters, he never inverts letters. I've, I've read a lot of manuscript material, I have read a lot of manuscript material, and Einstein has one of the most reliable and secure hands. Some if he's writing quickly and you're having trouble reading it, you sit down and sort of take a deep breath and you say, all the letters are there, let's read it quickly. And that doesn't work with other people, you know, let, let's read it carefully and you can see it. Now, there is one further thing. It is, it is true uh, that Einstein took on it mathematicians as assistants, and he did lament that he was not a good mathematician, uh, and indeed he was slow to adopt mathematical methods. He did not use uh, 1905, especially also in 1907, Bukowski shows a beautiful mathematical technique for uh, working with the theory. Einstein doesn't take it fully on board until about 1912, and we even have a notebook from that time where you can see Einstein teaching himself Bukowski's methods. Uh, and so, you know, he laments he's not good at, uh, at mathematics. Now, we need to be calibrated here. Right? Um, Einstein is saying, yeah, think, think who he's hanging out with. Minkowski, Hilbert, Klein. You know, these are the great mathematicians of the era. And no, he's not as good as they are. But, um, I, you know, I, when I work through his calculations, he's a hell of a lot better at calculus than I am. He does these long, complicated calculations, and he gets them out, and he knows where he's going. Um, you know, but, but before he's finished. So, you know, so I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think I think it's a it's a good story to you know, if your kids having trouble at school, but uh, <laughs> if your kids having trouble at school, it's not evidence that your kids are not smart. Well, this is a very public venue, so I'm 
so I can summarize I can summarize my attitude to it in a way that conforms precisely with the talk I've just given. Um, Einstein had a 19th century morality. And I, I, it's a serious answer. If you look at what the moral standards were in the 19th century, Einstein conforms. Any other questions? Well, let's uh, let's thank John.